fight choreography of the year. Fights in tight spaces. Right at the start of the 2006 reboot of Casino Royale, there's this really striking visual sequence that features James Bond rendered in a flat-toned, minimalist style. It sands away all of the details and just leaves you with the graceful motion and physicality. Fights in Tight Spaces is all about putting you into that sequence and letting you choreograph the fight scenes. And it does this in one of my favorite ways, which is by using the mechanics of a deck-building roguelite in the vein of Slay the Spire. But in this case, it also uses an isometric grid-based map reminiscent of a tactics game. In this game, all of your cards are types of physical attacks, including but not limited to German suplexes, a 540-degree spinning kick, a Superman punch off the wall, and just cutting someone. And all of these things have wildly different properties. Like take the suplex, for example. It repositions the target and grounds them so they can't attack you next turn, and it also opens them up to follow-ups like stomping on them. And the Superman punch requires your back to be to a wall, but it propels you forward. And when you move enemies around, it can cause them to miss attacks against you, and it can also cause them to hit each other. You can also just jettison a guy out a window. I put together quite a few runs based purely on ringing enemies out. It's incredibly rewarding to put together this stylish dance of violence while making complicated tactical decisions about how to spend your energy, how to avoid damage, how to position yourself, and how to get offense going. Then, at the very end of the battle, you get the option to play it all back as one semi-fluid, contiguous fight. You get to sit there and appreciate the scene that you just composed. Spookiest game of the year, Little Nightmares 2. The world has teeth, and it can bite you with them whenever it wants. That line is from The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon by Stephen King. It's about a little girl who gets lost in the woods and finds out just how sharp the world's teeth can be. Little Nightmares 2, likewise, opens with a shy young child, Mono, lost in the woods and learning that same lesson. Where the girl who loved Tom Gordon is grounded in reality, the world of Little Nightmares is a bleak, warped land where everything towers over you. Where, with only one exception, the only other people you come across are all trying to kill you. It's a world in which you're constantly finding scores of empty sets of shoes and clothes. And the implication there chills me. And that's how Little Nightmares 2 does all of its storytelling. There's no dialogue, almost no text, just eerie and disturbing imagery and symbolism and a wordless plot. It's transfixing. The images have been swimming around in my head, asking me to interpret and reinterpret them since I finished it last year. And of course, there's the gripping drama of experiencing Mono finding out that the world has teeth and that it can bite him whenever it wants. Loop of the Year Returnal Returnal starts with you as the main character, Selene, crash landing on a planet that bears the name of the Greek fate responsible for cutting the thread of life when one is destined to die. Atropos. Selene's ship Helios is totaled. You crawl out of the wreckage and everything is alien to you. Everything seems dangerous. The planet is crawling with symbiotic parasites. There's technology, the likes of which you've never seen. Some of it might be useful even, but the only way to figure out what anything does, including the parasites, is to just try see what happens. Maybe it won't be too bad. The colossal architecture dwarfs Selene, but for all the signs of civilization, there also appears to be almost nobody left. Just history and hostile fauna who show up to turn Selene's existential hell into a bullet hell. Her suit is damaged and prone to malfunctions if you aren't careful. If enough of them pile up, it becomes catastrophic. 
Sometimes, you'll hear a distress beacon, some sign that there's somebody else out there, that you aren't alone. But when you trace them back to the source, it's you. The bodies of countless other yous from different loops. That's when it becomes clear that Selene isn't simply marooned on this world. This is hell, and she is condemned to dwell here seemingly forever. It's chilling. And that dread comprises the outermost layer of Returnal. A little deeper in, though, once you're armed with hard-won knowledge, experience, and maybe an air dash and some other bells and whistles, that thick unease softens just a little bit and gives way to pure exhilaration as you struggle to find a way to finally escape Atropos. The mechanics here are crisp, the combat is intense, the pace is blistering, and this being a roguelike, the tension gets ratcheted up even higher because the risk of dying and having to restart from the beginning is always there. It's always looming overhead. It's so damn sweaty and frantic and fun. And as intimidating as some of the bosses are, they're also metal. And some of the best boss fights that I have had in a third person shooter ever. The runs are also meaty. The sweet spot most roguelikes have settled on in terms of length seems to be about one to two hours, but Returnals can blow past that at four to five or more. Meaning if you fail deep into a run, it's all the more agonizing. Runs become grueling endurance tests, and as a result, it helps place you more squarely in Celine's boots. But the reward for the extra time and effort it demands is all the sweeter. Most challenging game of the year for people with very dry eyes. Before your eyes. The primary way you interact with Before Your Eyes is by setting up a webcam and blinking. Or rather, trying not to blink. Because when you do, both you and your character, Benny, will open your eyes to a new scene. Benny's recently passed on and starts the game on the ferry to the afterlife. He reflects on his life starting from early childhood in an intimate series of vignettes. Whenever you blink, you advance to a new scene even if it was only halfway done. The first time, it's a real gut punch. I remember feeling regretful and dismayed like something was ripped away from me that I couldn't get back. Obviously, I could just restart the game, but that's not really in the spirit of things. The sourness of that experience, though, reinforced the beauty. All of these quiet, intimate scenes are extremely fleeting. It makes them feel precious. You're fighting to hold on, to linger in these moments, to be present and mindful and take in as much as you can. I think there's also something to be said about how, yes, it leaves you with a forlorn feeling to lose a scene, but you're always dumped into a new one. You can't spend too much time thinking about what you might have missed out on, because if you do, you risk not appreciating what's in front of you right now. And so it teaches you to cherish every ephemeral moment you can. Best game of the year to play with friends. It takes two. Not since Portal 2 have I seen such a lovingly crafted and ingenious co-op campaign as that of It Takes Two. Co-op is a feature of plenty of games, but few are designed around it like this is. Right down to the included Friends Pass, which lets you share your copy of the game with whoever you want to play through it with, so you don't each need to buy a separate copy. It's an asymmetric puzzle platformer where you and your buddy have very different abilities which change depending on the level. You both need to coordinate your abilities to figure out how to help each other move forward. When I play this, I go on voice chat with my friend and we just have a blast trying to figure out how to solve each section, uh, messing up, trolling each other, and just having a laugh. It's pure bliss. And then you can take a break and play mini games. <laughs> 
playing through this with a friend was one of the most genuinely delightful times I had with a game all year last year. It's actually kind of hard to write anything cogent because when I think about this game, I just kind of want to make happy noises, which many say aren't actually words at all. I felt invigorated and overjoyed playing this. It is the perfect game to play with good company. Best Little Dudes of the Year, Kenna and the Bridge of Spirits. Look at these hats! One of them's a pancake! Then there's a cowboy hat, one of them's wearing the top half of an eggshell. It's the cutest! And I get to mix and match them to my heart's content. These little fellas with the big doe eyes are called rots, and there are a lot of them to find in Kenna. Normally, I'm pretty collectibles averse, but finding new rots was a treat. You know how in Journey one of the collectibles was pieces of your scarf, and as you got more, your scarf would grow and trail far behind you majestically? The rots are your scarf here. And even better, they're alive and they can do things, like find different parts of the environment to sit on or play with when you stop somewhere. You can even get them to pose for photos! There are enemies and combat and puzzles and dungeons, and they're all varying degrees of okay to quite good. But the thing that really stuck with me from Kenna were the down-tempo moments. Stuff like finding and collecting new adorable companions, also finding new hats for them to wear, but also performing kind gestures for people you never meet, like delivering their mail for them, or restoring things by returning a fox statue in the woods to its place of quiet dignity. Healing is one of Kana's major themes, and that shines through in moments like that, or when you find meditation spots. They're few and far between, but they're a pleasure to find because you gain more max HP, but also because everything gets serene and quiet, and you get some gorgeous camera shots of the area. It's a pure and simple vibe check, and Ken is a game with immaculate vibes. Top 10 reasons in no particular order why I love Inscription. Number 10, praise be to the Manta God. Number 9, it possesses the properties of both a roguelike deck builder and an escape room. There are meta layers upon meta layers to this game as everyone expected there would be from the developers who previously made Pony Island. It starts with you trapped in a cabin playing a board game with the owner, Leshy. That's where most of the gameplay takes place, except you can stand up from the table and look around and solve all sorts of escape room-esque puzzles to find new unique things that you can use during your runs. Number 8. I can become the Bone Lord! Number 7. This game can get me to say sentences like, I really hope I find a cockroach. It's because they're really useful. They have a sigil called Undying, which means that whenever it dies, it goes immediately back to your hand and you can replay it as long as you have the resources to do so. And that powerful sigil can be transplanted onto other things. And if you, say, transplant it onto something with the sigil corpse maggots, you will have a minion that infinitely resummons itself onto the board whenever it dies. Plus, it has great synergy with number six, Gek. Look at this perfect Gek. This cute little goofball. Look at the raw power of this majestic creature. That, folks, is a 1-1 stat line. And the cost? Nothing. If you want the shark, blood must be shed. If you want the bear, blood must be shed. If you want the... Blood must be shed. But the Gek, a creature of peace and benevolence, has no blood price to pay. And if you, say, stick on dying on it, you can sacrifice it over and over and over again. Or it can throw its life away 40 times to single-handedly defeat. Number five, the moon. I was not ready for this level of dramatic escalation in a card game, but then Lushy plucks the moon out of the sky and turns it into a giant card for you to have a boss fight against. It's awesome. <laughs> Number four, the music bops. During that moon sequence, a bop. The trappers trying to hunt and skin you? 
You don't need skin to hear that his theme is a bop. It's bops all the way down. Number three, Casey's Mod. Casey's Mod is DLC for the game that came out after launch. It strips away all the puzzles, the meta layers, the plot twists, the second and third act, and other things to focus on being a mode for someone like me craving a slightly more traditional deck building roguelite experience, complete with new cards and a series of escalating challenges. Plus, remember long, long ago when I said that the music bops? There's more of that in here too! Number two, Flavor Town. The theme of the game is sacrifice and pain. Your currency is teeth, and you can even wrench them out of your own mouth to create an advantage. In order to play a creature, you need a resource, just like in Slay the Spire or any other card game. But here, that energy source reflects the theme. You have to sacrifice a minion, sometimes multiple, to summon your stronger beasts. You draw one card a turn, either something from the deck or a side deck, full of squirrels. Squirrels are free to play, they are 0-1 creatures, and that essentially makes them the game's equivalent to energy because they're usually just fodder to get your stronger cards out. Every time one of your creatures dies, including from sacrifice, you also get their bones which acts as a secondary energy resource to play cards with. I love the ways in which all of the mechanics line up thematically. Number one, Strange Larva. The Strange Larva will never forsake you. Mothman will always get it done for you. Put your faith in Mothman and your beans on his pedestal. Amen, and may his benevolence Help me get the 2022 Game of the Year video out before 2024. Thank you all for watching. Take it easy. Have a good one, everyone, including you, Mothman.